How you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji. Welcome to another episode of Tear Talk. Guys, today's a great episode. Uh, Russ did a show the other day with me when he talked about his experiences with Richard Ramirez. And one of the things that he mentioned was that he dealt with the person and not the larger than life monster that the media portrayed. And this is no way to negate or minimize what he's done, but to bring in the reality at the end of the day, these guys, when they come into the system, they will be not this larger than life monster to most of us. It's just going to be someone that we're dealing with on a regular basis, especially if been in the business for a while. Some of these crimes start to blend. I mean, yes, the media may have picked up on it, but to be honest with you, there are some crimes in these facilities that the media never picked up on that are more horrific. So this dialogue today is to basically tell you how we kind of manage that those, those two extremes. So the larger than life monster that is being painted, that's being projected. And then the, I guess if you want to go on the extreme, the person with all their vulnerabilities. Uh, and I think this, it's kind of like managing the middle between those extremes. My guest today is going to be Joe Paponio. Let me bring him on. What's up, Joe? Hey, Anthony. What's going on, brother? Good. Good to have you. Joe, you mind introducing yourself to our audience, please? Yes, sir. My name is Joe Pomponio. I'm a retired lieutenant of 29 years and six months from the Texas Department of Corrections. And I'm currently working as an assistant jail administrator in our local sheriff's department in the jail division and a panel member here for Cheer Talk. Yes, we love having you, Joe. Joe, do you think this dialogue makes sense, like basically managing that balance between the larger than life monster that will be portrayed, especially in some high profile cases, versus once they come in, basically us having to deal with the person that may not be that larger than life monster that people have portrayed. And guys, just so we know, we're not negating or minimize what anybody's done. We're just drawing a dialogue and how we manage them inside the facility. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely, there's definitely two personas there. You got the persona that the public sees and then you have the persona that the department of correction actually deals with. Uh, a lot of the times are, are two different, two different personalities, especially when you get them away from the their media audience and, you know, out of the limelight, um, you know, you, you, you would be uh, surprised to see how much of a change in personality there is once you actually get them away from their uh, audience and into a uh, confined, uh, confined, not area, but a confined setting where, you know, you're dealing with the with the person one on one, um, it, it's a whole different behavior display. Yeah. And guys, when we're having this dialogue, remember, I want people to take into context. This is not to minimize or negate what they've done, but just a, a, a perspective, because trust and believe me, Joe Russ, we're very um, anti criminal. Even though we have a job to do, we are anti criminal. We just have a job to do. So with that said, I, I've noticed that when it comes to these extremes, I can give you an example just in the work setting. Um, when you're on the custody side, your job is always to see the wolf. And, and it's tough to have to maintain that perspective because sometimes it travels with you outside of work, but it's a needed perspective because in corrections, if you don't prepare for the wolf, you could be extremely gullible. And we don't want that from the people. We don't really want that from anybody that comes into corrections, but we definitely don't want that from our custody, our, our correctional officers, our correctional staff, because they are the final fail safe. Remember, even though we, you know, we're a family and we, we all work together, co the correction side, uh, the correctional officer sides are the one that basically we're the fail safe for uh, the rehabilitative side. You know, even though it's a partnership effort, you know, we're the ones that make sure things are in alignment with safety and security. So we always prepare an expectation, uh, basically worst case scenario, which means that even if the person is smiling to us day by day, we're also aware of who this person was, what they're able to do. And that's our perspective. Sometimes from the rehabilitation side, their objective is I, I got to change this person. Uh, they have to be better than what they were when they came in. So their expectation, or it may be even so much their hope is in who they can make them become. And there's a difference there because the difference is highlighted in those two expectations. And how do you balance that in the middle? And I think that's a tremendous balance, both for the correctional officer side and for the rehabilitative side. But I also think that translates into the public as well, because recently I was did that video on that letter 
that was written by Wade Wilson's adopted parents. And basically everybody was to blame except for Wade Wilson, who actually committed the, the crimes. Now, when you expose that to the media and the media, you know, runs with it, the person that most people may see may not be that of a murderer, but rather that of a victim, whether it was a victim of the criminal justice system, a victim of uh, his me own mental health and drug addictions. I mean, either way, it shifts from the level of accountability in which acknowledges that, no, this person is, isn't just a victim. They are uh, a monster for what they have done. So I think part of this dialogue is how do you know who you're really dealing with? And I think in corrections, that's one of the things we've become experts in. I think we are very in tune with who that person really is. Are they larger than life monster or are they a person filled with tons of vulnerabilities that the media just ran with? Um, and made them into a larger than life monster. And I'm going to explain that because the people that are watching that may think or watching this may think we're saying this to minimize what they've done. And I'm not. I'm actually saying it because when the media paints that perspective of that person being a larger than life monster, it makes us hesitant. It could make us fearful because we're also human as well. We don't want to deal with larger than life monsters. But what, what helps us out is all of a sudden when we finally do deal with the individual, we may not see that monster. We just may see a person that uh, literally um, when, when they don't have a chance to prey on the weak turns out to be a very weak individual who wind up being given the strength from the media to make them that larger than life monster. Does that make sense, Joe? Yeah, it does. You know, you know, one of our responsibilities when we get these guys in is to, you know, we treat them all. We treat them all the same. We treat them all like they're manipulators. You know, we're always on our toes regarding that. You know, and we try to give them some sort of correctional normalcy once we get them um, to kind of get them resigned into being into a routine uh, of the correctional setting. You know, and I, you know, I've I've seen I've seen guys, you know, even even old coworkers that were arrested for doing some heinous things. We have we have one that was uh, arrested uh, quite a few years back. He was he was known as the Twilight Rapist. Um, he was, he was raping elderly people all the while working in the department of corrections as the food service manager. And, you know, uh, once you get that type of individual in that's had that kind of notoriety and you get them in a one-on-one -on -one setting, you would be surprised how vulnerable, how scared they are to be in that setting because they're no longer, they're no longer that cell block warrior that's talking that trash to the media on one side of the outlet or the other or in court where, you know, he's got people around him to protect him. Um, once you get him in a, in a confined setting, the personality drastically changes most times. Um, they, they, they figure out that they're no longer controlled or no longer um, associated with, with high press media. Um, they know at some point that, you know, their their name is just going to be a name within years. Uh, you know, somebody else will take the limelight later on down the road. Um, you know, and once you get them into that correctional setting, you know, part of our, like I said, part of our responsibility is to give them, to get them situated with some sort of correctional normalcy, even though in the back of our minds, we're treating them uh, like they're the worst of the worst, um, that they can be totally manipulative if they want to be. Um, so those are things that we still have to be on guard for. Um, but, you know, once you, like I said, you know, once you get them in a correctional setting, you know, you, you can pretty much almost damn near instantly see a personality shift um, from the person who looked like a monster in the media, confident, arrogant, cocky. Um, now you got somebody who's just taking his DOC photo that looks, you know, haggard and, and full of self-doubt and a lot of worry. Yeah, and, and you know what's funny? When these monsters are on the outside, let's say, um, when 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 we're st when they're still on the run doing what they got to do, uh, obviously there may be some freedom uh, when they go to do, which means that they kind of pick their prey, uh, they make sure their prey is vulnerable, and they go in knowing that they control the situation. Where once they're locked in, uh, that's not the case. Uh, there's a lot of obstacles that should be in their way uh, before they're able to be that predator 
uh, that they were on the street. So that's why when they get locked in, a lot of people from the outside may call up and say, yo, Gange, hey, you got the Night Stalker there? I mean, how, is it crazy? What's he like? And then you turn around and say, oh, he's quiet. Doesn't really do much. Keeps to himself. And they're like, what do you mean he keeps to himself? Outside on the street, you know, he was this. I mean, but did you expect them to come in that way too? I mean, did you expect this person to come in and then as soon as he came in, he starts raping everyone? You know, they get so shocked when you're able to tell them who this person is. And you want to hear something funny. Uh, and this is not in all cases, but in some, some actually want to get caught because it actually uh, puts them in a position where they have to stop being driven by that impulse to rape and kill. Does that make sense, uh, Joe? Yeah, and that's kind of that's kind of what what happened in the case down here. Um, you know, he I don't know if he intentionally just got messy and 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 the way he conducted his his rapes, but uh, eventually he left enough evidence behind that uh, he was able to be caught and. You know, one of the things about it is, you know, like I said, he worked with he worked with inmates day in and day out as a food service manager in the food service department. And, you know, uh, even though we were we were shocked, he he pretty much showed no emotion other than almost like a mental relief that, you know, he was he was almost glad that he was caught, not that he was being arrogant about it. He was just glad he was caught. Um, so I guess it, it couldn't happen anymore. But. You know, by that time, the, the damage was done. There were there were several rapes committed by him. And, you know, he needed to be taken off the street forever. Yeah. And, and guys, I want people to know that there's sometimes there's a difference in perspective between those who work law enforcement and those who uh, maybe just regular civilians out in the public. Law enforcement is trained to see um, the worst to some extent. Uh, you know, what we call universal precaution. Now, universal precaution doesn't mean um, uh, we stop seeing the best in people, but we have to always be aware that any moment, and, and this is just very general, but any Santa Claus could be a pedophile. Our job is to try to manage uh, that those extreme perspectives to make sure it doesn't bleed into the point we become paranoid. But if managed, it's a very healthy tool to have as a law enforcement professional, because it keeps you on your toes. It, 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 it doesn't make you gullible. Uh, with that said, I would like to say most of the people that are in the helping role, whether in corrections or out in the real world, uh, they also should be given that type of universal precaution. Because at the end of the day, people love to take advantage of people that are in helping roles. That's why when you work for an agency, the agency is the filter. You know, the, the people that come in to help the inmates, they don't work for the inmate. They work for the agency. There's a prescribed role. And then custody helps the uh, person in those helping roles just to make sure that uh, their want to help, their dedication uh, doesn't get manipulated into something more than it should be. Uh, but I also see the same thing with the public. When you got this guy, Wade Wilson, coming out, and the media kind of paints this picture, one that's a larger than life monster. So that's on one side. But then there's another picture that's being painted that, you know, he's a victim of all these different circumstances. People are going to relate to either side of, of the extreme. And there's some in the middle. Don't get me wrong. But there'll be people that are going to relate to the victim side who believe they can help them. So their perspective of this person is not the monster, but the but the angel that has yet to come out. So they're going to want to find that angel and. They wind up falling in love with who they think this person is and not necessarily who they really are. Then there's the other side that is so extreme that they believe that by giving them a TV and corrections, you're giving them too much comfort. And again, we did a video explaining, you know, why inmates may have certain things, how it's considered leverage and a tool just in case they act a fool, we're able to manage their behavior. But I, I note that just to note the extremes, but the balance in the middle is to be honest with you, is to not let either side of those extremes affect your perspective. And what I mean by that is you got to see what's in front of you. I mean, literally what's in front of you, unbiased of anyone else's perspective. Russ, when he dealt with Richard Ramirez, Russ wasn't so caught up in the news where, you know, he was so concerned that he's going to deal with this monster and then be hesitant in his interactions because I want people to know, yes, they've done some crazy things. But if you work in corrections and and and, and you totally 100 percent believe 
that this person's this monster, that could make you very hesitant and very fearful to want to interact with them. So you have to have a balance and look for weaknesses. And then when you start to look for weakness, weaknesses, you start to see, yo, this guy, it, yes, he's done some crazy things. And I'm not minimizing that, but in order for me to be effective and, and having to deal with him, I have to find the person in here. Because if I don't find the person and all I see is the monster, then how am I going to try to make uh, an effort to control this individual without being fearful myself? Uh, especially even in this case here, we're talking about Richard Ramirez, but don't forget, guys, uh, you got female officers that have to deal with these individuals as well. So if, if their main target are females, you know, the female officers have to find a way to balance that larger than life fear that has been portrayed with the uh, vulnerable person. And it's in the middle. Is, does that make sense, Joe? Am, am I making any sense? Because this is tough. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's a tough subject because, you know, let's let's go from the beginning. You know, number one, the, the, the public and law enforcement deals with the, the worst that society has to offer initially. They're the ones that discover the crime scenes. They're the ones that hear about the crime scenes. They get to see the pictures of the crime scenes. You know, they they discover who this individual is as a criminal. So they see they see the initial. You know, all that's relayed to the to the public. You know, through the news media, and that and that's all the public gets to see is the initial impression. You know, does it does it negate what this guy did? Hell no, not not in the least. But. You know, and this is and this is just me personally. I tend to not watch my local news for my area on purpose, just for the fact that you know, if somebody comes into my facility that is so heinous, I'd rather not know about it. I'd rather, I'd rather just know that he committed a murder. Um, you know, I don't need to know all the specifics. It doesn't really make a shit to me because you know I'm going to treat them all the same regardless, and I'd rather not have any you know, uh, pre-bias, you know, information from law enforcement, because, you know, we all, we all get that, 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 you know, that, that notion from, not notion, but we get the info from the law enforcement community. Hey man, watch this guy. He's a piece of shit. He's dangerous, blah, blah. You know, he's, he's, you know, he's this, he's that, which is fine. You know, we're, we, we as correctional professionals are trained to, to kind of cope with that. You know, we know we can deal with anybody from, you know, a drug possession charge up to, you know, a, a being a serial killer. Um, you know, we don't once they're in our custody, we don't treat the individual any different other than, you know, unless it's so high profile that he requires he requires some sort of uh, uh, personal protection, uh, you know, protective custody. Otherwise, you know, we try to treat them, we try to treat them all the same, you know, and, and I understand that the media portrays the, the larger than life monster. And you have some people on that pendulum where, you know, he's 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 a horrific monster. Um, you know, the law enforcement, law enforcement's arrested him. And then you got the family members and the neighbors that said, you know, he was such a quiet individual. You know, he, he we never thought in a million years he would do something like this. You know, we've all been we've all been around or lived by or worked with one of those style people. Does it change the outcome of what he did? Absolutely not. Does it change the way that we're going to treat this individual? Absolutely not. Because, you know, we're going to treat them all like they're manipulators. We're going to treat them all, you know, uh, like they're liars. We're going to treat them all like they may be emotionally unbalanced. You know, that's 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 our job to understand and deal with that until you know they they give us that 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 notion that you know they're they're no longer considered to be that person that you know they're a person that may like the same sports team you do you may have the same likes you do may have the same dislikes you do may like the same president may not like the same president you know every it, when it comes down to it every every criminal is an individual you know um, you know, and, and, and that's just something that we see on our side once we get them away from the hype and the limelight. Yeah. And I've actually seen where, when you're doing your rounds, as we mentioned a little bit earlier, and you know, you're doing your tours, some of these inmates that are high profile that have done, you know, uh, like we mentioned before, serial uh, rape, maybe serial killers, whatever it is, when they're in a controlled environment that's structured, uh, they tend not to be as problematic and they tend to actually be somewhat content. Um, there could be some that, you know, may not, you know, may have been controlled by the impulse, 
and just the impulse got the best of them. Or there are some that truly want to be controlled by the impulse, which is another scary thought. But I, I, the reason why I wanted to mention this is that in corrections, we can't get so blinded by both sides of the extreme because we have a job to do. So like if, if the media paints this picture that this person is a larger than life monster uh, where, yes, don't get me wrong, what they've done, again, not negating or minimizing that, but to the point where they're uncontrollable and whatever it is now, the people that have to work around them that have to make sure this person is in control, they can't allow that larger to life monster set in to the point where they become paranoid. You know, you could have officers that, you know, with Richard Ramirez, you know, and, oh my God, he's staring at me. He it looks like he's going to rape me. I can't work this unit anymore. I just can't. It's like, well, you know, you, you, you got a job. You know, you got a job. He maybe he could have been staring at you. Could have been for that. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying it's not, but he also could have been staring at you because he's trying to get your attention for something. You know, so maybe when when someone's staring at you, instead of avoiding it, you should engage it. Excuse me, what are you looking at? Is there something you want? As opposed to making the assumption that's what it is. Now, granted, I'm not saying that's not the case because it could be that, but most people will get so concerned that. They're afraid of this larger than life monster that instead of them engaging to find out what's really going on, they run on the assumption that feeds the fear. And now they're no longer being effective. Uh, does that make does that make sense, Joe, at all? Yeah. I mean, and I've seen and I've seen staff become hesitant just because of one one person's notoriety. Um, you know, and and it, in the grand scheme of things, we we still have a job to do. We still have to interact with this person. We still have to make sure that they follow the rules and regulations. We still got to make sure that they're safe. We still got to make sure they have access to medical. Uh, they get fed. They get clean clothes. Get a shower. You know, have access to a law library. You know, they they still require the same the same you know uh, things that any other convict does. And and we, just because of their notoriety, that shouldn't that shouldn't make us hesitant to do our jobs. Um, you know, you knew signing on for signing on with this, uh, with the department that at some point you're going to deal with somebody high profile, you know, it, it, it's, it's not a matter of if it's just a matter of when, um, uh, you know, and, you know, once that, once that person comes in, you know, we, uh, you know, I, I'll tell them, you know, first off, as long as you are respectful to me and my staff, I promise you, we will be respectful to you. Um, you know, I don't care what the media says. I don't care, you know. I, I just I, I block all that out because once they come into the Department of Corrections, they're no longer high profile to me. They're just a, another inmate. Right. And that's how I treat them. Um, and that's how everybody should look at it. You shouldn't be afraid to to, you know, <clears throat> deal with it. Uh, and you shouldn't be afraid to interact with them because it's your job. You have to interact in them. You know, uh, you know, at some point you're you're going to have to interact with them, you know, regardless of if you're doing rounds or if you're passing out mail, if you're doing this, if you're doing that, you know, at, at like, and then it's something I've taught in the Academy, you know, treat them all, treat them all like they're violent offenders, treat them all like, you know, like they can be manipulative, treat them all like they could have some sort of medical disease that, you know, you know, just so that, you know, everybody is safe in their practices when they're doing searches and stuff. Um, but I tell them, don't, don't treat them any different just because of their status. You know, at some point that status goes away. Right. And, and, and guys, now how does this translate to the public? Uh, and I also think this, this also translates behind the wall as well. A while ago, we did a show and basically, um, Russ, myself, I want to say Joe was on, or definitely we've discussed it, even if it wasn't a devoted show to it, it's questions that came along during the show. If we did a live or something where, this topic came in, but you know, we cannot mix like who we are and how we feel and project it onto um, the people that we oversee, or in this case here, if it's from the public, you know, if, if you have such a want to uh, see, let's say in this case here, Wade Wilson as a good person, because there are people that are connected to this person because they're believing the victim card. Well, the problem is you could be putting a lot of belief that you have and projecting it on this individual as if they see things the same way. And I need people to realize that that's not always the case. Um, how you see the world uh, may not be how they see the world. So your effort to find reason may not be there, even though they could sell you it, they could get you to believe it. Uh, they just don't see the world the same way. 
Uh, again, in this case here, Wade Wilson, obviously I'm not saying every inmate uh, that we house in the systems are truly sociopathic or psychopathic. Um, but with that said, you know, if you go ahead and put investment into the wrong person, you know, believing that they are this victim after, in this case here, what they've done, and you believe that you're the person that can save them, I will guarantee you a lot of the values that you're putting on that person are the values that you believe in, that you now think that this person automatically has, and they may not. And you're going to be going in there uh, believing it is until you realize one day uh, that it's not. And I also like to mention on the correctional side, we have to deal with the person we are dealing with in that moment. And it's true. Uh, you know, I may know that this person has the potential to go left or right. But at the end of the day, if you're respectful for me in the moment, I'll be respectful right back. It doesn't mean that, you know, in my effort to be respectful, I'm overly friendly. Or in my effort to be respectful, um, I'm extremely guarded because I like to think I'm always guarded, but not to the point where I'm paranoid. So that's where the balance is. But I deal with who you are right now, who yeah. you are right now within the context of what I know about you. Does that make sense, Joe? Yeah. And, you know, a lot a lot of the times a lot of staff will overhype them, overhype the individual to a point where they 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 have this overwhelming hatred. Uh, for an individual and you know it 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 doesn't it doesn't affect the inmate much but it affects your mental status more because you know you know that you have to go in every day and you know you're thinking man this guy's a piece of shit i can't stand this motherfucker um uh you know i hate having to work with this fucking thing and you know eventually it takes more of an emotional toll on you than it does the inmate so, you know, don't don't overhype the individual, you know, it, you know, it, is his crime so, so heinous that, you know, somebody else hadn't committed something as heinous. I mean, you know, I just as an example, you know, guy may be a, a, a serial prostitute killer. He killed five prostitutes in, in, in a in a one year time span. And you got a you got a guy on the opposite opposite end of the building in a cell block who, you know, did three lines of cocaine, got in a car and caused a head-on collision, killing a whole family of six. You know, is it really any more heinous? No, not really, because, you know, they're both the same. Loss of life was still there. The difference is, is, is you know, how much hype this guy's had in the media. You know, it just happens to be the one that the media latched on to because, you know, bad shit sells. You know, it, it, mm. the media is, is all about the, the, the bad shit. You know, so, you know, that don't, that's why I say treat them all the same. Treat them all like the murderers, treat them all like they got AIDS, treat them all, you know, treat them all, yeah, just treat them all the same. Because yeah, if you allow, if you allow what these individuals done to get inside your head, it will fuck you up more than it will ever mess with that convict's head while he's in custody. He may be in there for life. And you may be only doing 20 years in, in your service and you're going to come out of that knowing you still have a hatred for this individual because he's still alive. You know, I'm telling you, it will mess with your mental status more than it will ever affect that inmate ever. Yeah. And I like what you said, because you drew the uh, one, you said the universal precaution, you know, if, if that works, you know, I agree with that, you know, believe that they all, but just don't be paranoid about it. So you got to have, you know, that, that boundary there, but not to the point where it controls your every move. I mean, universal yeah. precaution doesn't mean you stop interacting. It just means you're prepared that it could go this way or that way. And I love your scenario too, because even though you have like a serial killer versus someone who's, you know, maybe drinking and driving a bit because the other person was drinking and driving, correct? correct? You still know that the consequences of your behavior, like, you know, when someone's drinking and driving, you do know, you may not have intended to do it, but you did know that if you drove under the influence that you could hurt people. You know, yep. so, I mean, did we paint an extreme? It's funny because in corrections, they're treated no differently. Nope. You know, I, I mean, because one may be addicted to whatever it is that causes bad behavior. Maybe that's their excuse. And then you get the other one who's driven by murder. But at the end of the day, however you want to deal with their mental health concerns, safety and security wise, they're treated the same way. You know, they're going to be treated the same way. And I want to mention one more thing uh, that I think uh, does uh, paint a picture because um Again, I'm really digging into that dialogue that – did you get a chance to see the dialogue that we did with Russ Hamilton when he talked about his encountering with uh, Richard Ramirez? 
No, I didn't get to watch the whole thing. I got interrupted, so I'm going to have to go back and, and resume it tonight. Well, no, if you get a chance, I mean, the video was about 30-something minutes. It's got over 4,000 views, but I was reading the comments, and as I said, Russ mentioned the difference between dealing with the person and then dealing with the, the, the myth. I want to mention something, guys. When you work corrections, your frequency – with those individuals, uh, how they act to you uh, during those moments, because you're going to interact with them a lot more than you ever did before. That's kind of how you're going to define your perspective of them. Because even though, like, if you're watching things on the news, they're going to paint this larger than life image. Whichever way the story needs to go, they got to sell it. They may paint the victim image on, on one network, and they may paint the murderer image on the other network. So whatever one you connect to, that's who you're introduced to. That's who you're frequenting. Like that's what you're seeing routinely. So you're going to connect to that because that's a routine. That's frequency. You know, that's, that's who you're going to connect to and that's who you're going to see. So if you see the victim, because that's the only thing you're watching and that's what you're kind of, you know, I guess confirmation bias, that's what you're also seeking. Then the person becomes a victim and then you start feeding that fantasy. If the person's the monster and that's what you want to see, then you start watching thing on TV that paints them as the monster that obviously that fills that level of the fantasy. When you're in the prison setting, you see the person for what he is with no filter. There's no media telling you who that person is anymore. You know, and, and, and like Joe said, I'm not taking the opinion of anybody else. I mean, most of the time when you deal with these high profile inmates, it's funny because we look for inmates that make our day easier. That's how we judge people because that's what we have to deal with them every day. So I can have a, a guy that may not be in for a crazy crime, but he's a pain in the ass. So I just don't want to deal with that guy. But then I get Joe Paponio who's in for six murders. And when someone's like, well, what's he like? Well, he's not a problem. Keeps to himself. So I'd rather deal with 20 Joe Paponios than one of these drug addicts who just keeps on uh, challenging the system or, or, or is very entitled so I think it's the frequency and routine that makes us figure out who this person could really be. Uh, but again, we're still guarded to make sure uh, we don't go into the extreme of, of, of either side. But with that said, Joe, the frequency and routine of what we do introduces us to who that person really is. And I really don't think it's uh, most of the time it's never going to be on an extreme for us because we wouldn't be able to do our job either way. One, we'd be gullible or the other, we'd be paranoid and fearful. So who they really are is somewhere in the middle of that perspective, you know, because even when, when they did the letter, the, the guy read the letter with the adopted parents. Now, a lot of people are like, well, he was a monster, but they only see a certain image of him. They only have interaction with that one image. They haven't really had an interaction with who that monster was. You know, in corrections, we may once in a while get an interaction of both. One day the guy's a monster, one day the guy's this, and we're always staying in the middle. But I do believe that we tend to stay focused on what we are routinely exposed to more frequently. So granted, if you take the parents in this case here, if they know him as a young kid, yes, he could have had problems, but maybe their immediate... Um, I don't want to say, I, I can't say, I'm not trying to say the word attraction, but they're, they, they, they took him. So their immediate uh, investment in him could have been like, this was a good kid or they could have helped him because they saw that maybe he came from two young parents and maybe they thought that they could give this kid something. So their initial impression of him is going to be of a good boy. So anything that challenges that initial expression, you have to realize something. The initial uh, impression of something is so powerful that it defines everything else that comes out after that, if that makes any sense. So like, I'll give you an example. If I said Joe's a nice guy, but, you know, and, and I compliment Joe at this highest level, and, and then the last four things I say are, are horribly miserable, it doesn't matter because they'll give excuses and minimize everything I said because I already introduced Joe as a nice guy. That's who we know. But if I went backwards and I said, Joe's a piece of shit, and then I give four qualities that are super nice, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, Joe's a piece of shit, so uh, he's selling you an image. Is that Am I, am I making sense here, yeah. Joe? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The first, the first. And not that you're a piece of shit, Joe. I'm not making sense that you're because you're not a piece hey, of shit. I've been called a piece of shit by the best of them, baby. <laughs> hey, from 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 executive from executive level on down, it don't matter to me. Oh, I still oh, sleep man. at night. You know, uh, you know when when it's it's one of those things where the first thing you see or hear is the first thing you buy. It it you know it it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what you heard on the ass end of the conversation. 
you know, uh, it's just like any other, any other thing, you know, that when, that you do in life, you know, if you're buying a car, you know, yeah, you hear, you hear about the motor that it has in it and it's, you know, the beautiful color and, and all this. And then, you know, towards the end you hear, you know, gets shitty gas mileage and, and, you know, uh, you know, that, that, that requires constant fill-ups, but you, you didn't hear all that because you're interested in the price of the car, the color of the car, the way the car looks, you know, so and it's, it's no different in life. You know, when we hear things in the media, it's the first thing we buy, it's the first thing we latch on to, and it's the first thing that sticks in our minds when we're dealing with people, you know, and, and it, it, you see that every, every day, every day. I mean, I, I've gotten employees who transferred to me that, you know, I was told we're, we're pieces of shits and, you know, they come to work for me, you know, for, for two, three, four weeks. And that they wound up being some of my best hands, you know, uh, just, you, you don't, you never, you never take the, the initial, the initial uh, review of, of a single individual. You know, I've always learned to, I never really listened to one person or another about, you know, you know, uh, how bad Ganji is or how bad Russ is. I'm that type of individual that, you know, I want to see that shit with my own eyes. I don't want to hear about it. Let me just work with them and, and, and let me see what I got, what I have to deal with, you know? So, yeah, you know, first thing it's, it's crazy how much people, people latch on to the first thing, even if it's from, from somebody they, they trust. I mean, the person that they trust may not have good information on this person. They're going, they're going based off of, of somebody else's assumption. And, and, and that person's going off of somebody else's assumption. <clears throat> so, you know, deal with it, deal with it yourself, make your own decisions, you know, don't, don't let outside influences, you know, negate the way you do your job. We still have a job to do and we need to do it. Yeah. And, and guys, I mean, obviously in corrections, I, I kind of deal with the person that's being presented to me. Uh, you know, again, within the context of, I know what this person is able to do, but I also deal with the person that's in front of me. Uh, however guarded I may be not to the point that I'm paranoid and also not to the point that I'm, 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 I'm gullible. I just deal with the person that's in front of me. Uh, and for those that are watching this, you know, on the news and they're trying to discover who they are, you got to ask yourself, you know, who's really creating that influence? Is it really this person that you're looking at or is it the other people on the side just, feeding stuff your way. I mean, for me, when you're watching this guy, Wade Wilson, I mean, it makes more sense to obviously lean towards he's a monster and he's a murderer. So I get that 100% because of what he's done. And I think that makes more sense to than, than leaning on. Uh, I love him. He's so cute. Or uh, I can change him. He's, he's been a victim. You know, I, I get the need for compassion because you're looking to co for compassion in the human element. But there are some people that don't relate to that. And I think a lot of people may not realize that. So I know there's two extremes. And sometimes when you work in corrections, you're caught in the middle of it. Because as I said, you had one people, uh, certain people that believe he could be saved and, and the death penalty is too harsh and, you know, all that. And then you get other people that, as I said before, believe TV is too much of a comfort and, you know, he deserves to die right now. And it's like, man, and here we are in corrections right in the middle of these extremes trying to say, guys, at the end of the day, I'm not managing his crimes. I'm managing him as a person. So, you know, I have to just do what's in front of me until whatever the, the courts decide what happens to him next. But I, I, I think a lot of the times we may we, we may think we're going on what we think or our original thoughts. We think they're ours, but they're not. So I think having a channel like this is great because we're able to tell people just another perspective, a perspective that doesn't land on the extremes and a perspective that lands safely in the middle so we can go ahead and manage without any type of, um, as I mentioned, those extremes could affect you either way. So we have to manage the person uh, within the context of what they've done, yes, but we still have to manage that person. So I thought this dialogue was just something to have because I believe there are two sides when, when dealing with anybody almost. And the question is, well, who is that person really? I mean, that's the key. Who is that person really? And to be honest with you, I know this may sound crazy, but you may never know. You may never know who anybody, you may never know who, even who your neighbor is, because at the end of the day, we're going to play different roles depending on who we're interacting with. But I will say this, when you work in a prison, and the dominant role or the dominant interaction is going to be that inmate 
with, you know, us as correctional staff, as long as we're consistent in our ways, we start to find out who that person really is. And sometimes these people that seem to be the rebel without a cause, well, they're crying at night in their cell <laughs> because they've realized that they fucked up their life or sometimes they won't. I mean, it can go either way. But or, uh, and then uh, you've seen it, Joe, right? I mean, it, yeah. it can go, or, the, or, or they're scared to death. You know, you you hear all the hype, and then you, you finally you finally uh, you're finally introduced. You know, and some and sometimes these individuals they they give themselves the hype. You know, and then you find out they're just a scared little kid. You know, uh, I have you know one that I had to transport. You know, several weeks ago from the county jail to the Department of Corrections here in Texas, and. Uh, we got to the back gate and uh, pulled into where their intake receiving is, and he's seen all the chain buses lined up, and there must have been probably 200 inmates standing out there waiting to be processed in, handcuffed together, standing two by two, and you know you could tell they've been working out. They weren't they weren't the skinniest things, and we pulled we pulled in. You know this this convicted murderer I had, uh, you know big bad gang member, talk talk nine miles of cash shit threw up in the back of my damn patrol unit. You know, so, you know, right then he went from 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 big, bad, big, bad wolf to to uh, a scared little boy. And, you know, a lot of that self hype, you know, they they give they give themselves that stigma. And then, you know, you find out later that, you know, <laughs> they're nowhere near the the beast that they, they think they are. And, you know, it's funny. Sometimes you have people that, you know, I mean, the guy's got all these tats on his face, which could give that bad guy persona. But it also could be just person trying to pretend that they're bad now when you go into a prison where those tattoos on the face don't really stand out because everyone pretty much has those tattoos on their faces you know it's okay you're no longer that bad persona anymore like you know i, I think a lot of people believe that those tattoos above the neck yeah he must be some real bad as an ass individual maybe he, i don't know I, I don't know enough about the individual but all i'm saying is it could also be a, a method that he utilizes to put a false facade on at yeah. the end of the day, he hopes you perceive that, but he may not be bad from within. Just the tattoos are meant to advertise a false persona. Hey, 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 Joe, you have anything you like to say in closing? Hopefully we're able to give out some type of nuggets here. Yeah, you know, and, and, you know, the public needs to understand that, yeah, there's 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 going to be two sides of this scenario. You know, you're going to see the the scenario that the that the the public and the news media portrays. You're going to see that persona in the courtroom where they got that stone face look and and you know dead cold stare and and everything that goes with the with that bad boy image but you know you got to understand once once they come into a penitentiary environment um a lot of the times that changes um you know they're 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 scared they're they're out of their norm they're out of their comfort zone they're in a they're in a position of where their choices don't matter because we're telling them what to do um you know so when it comes to, you know, portrayal, there's always going to be two sides, you know, two sides of the uh, that personality. You'll see the the media portrayal, the court portrayal, the law enforcement portrayal. And then, you know, you'll see the, you know, what we see is the Department of Corrections side. And, you know, a lot of the times when we bring them in, <clears throat> other than classification and, and, and getting some sort of family history, we don't even address the charges. Um, uh, at least I don't. I don't. I, refused to even, you know, glorify that dude with his charges. Uh, I, you know, I'll just tell him that, you know, I know what he's here for. And that's pretty much, you know, I, and that's my way of letting him know right off the bat. I don't give a shit who you are. I don't give a shit what you've done. Um, you're in my facility now and you're going to follow my rules and be compliant. And, you know, you, it's, it's a totally different persona than what you see on the media. Yeah. And again, guys, uh, we, we mentioned this because, I'm not minimizing what they've done, mm -hmm. uh, but you can't let that uh, larger than life monster image uh, affect, you know, especially us in corrections, how we have to do our job. Some of them, some of the inmates even may want to come in with that image yep. because they, they like it. They embrace it, you know, so they may try to hang on to that as long as they can until an officer goes, yo, you're just another inmate to me. You understand me? I don't care what card they, you're trying to play. Sometimes they try to do it to, to gain a higher social, uh, social standard. In, in the penitentiary, you know, to try to put the fear in everybody when he's actually scared to death himself. He's just hoping that what he's done is going to get him status. Yeah, it's going to gain him status in the, in the prison. And, and once they get challenged, especially as the crime starts to become less notorious, you know, as, as time progresses or, 
you know, once someone just turns up to him and says, yo, I don't give a shit what you've done. You know, at the end of the day, this problem is between me and you. And, and, and that's the same thing here. I've seen officers, you know, inmate will try to live on what they've done and an officer will quickly check them. So again, I mean, we have to be very wary that in corrections, we don't live on either side of the extreme. We don't live on the victim side and we don't live on the uh, larger than life fear side. But I would also like this dialogue to also translate to the outside, however you feel you have to apply it. But I, you don't want to live on the extremes to where uh, one, uh, you know, I, I get yet they're, they're a monster, but to be a point that you just want the person dead without understanding how the system needs to work in order to make sure justice is filled. You know, so we're not paying, you know, money out uh, later on at the end of the, at the end of the day for something that really wasn't thought, you know, thought through. Yes, it does cost taxpayers money, but there's a process there. Uh, yeah. it, it's not like someone mentioned China that as soon as they get the death penalty, they're killed right away. Uh, we actually have a uh, a better system a little bit because, uh, you know, even though we're not perfect, I get it. Um, you, you know, killing innocent people, that's the last thing we want in our conscience. So imagine when people that are fighting against death row or fighting against death penalties, they're fighting on it because they're concerned that we're going to go ahead and kill somebody that's innocent. So in order for us to beat that concern, it, it, it's not an overnight thing. We have to exhaust every option to show that, hey, every effort was put in place. We're confident, 100 percent confident that this is the person. So now after we after we do what we got to do and we execute them, you could sue all you want, you know, we because at the time, this is the information we had. We didn't rush it, whatever. And then you don't want to go to the other extreme where the person takes no accountability and everybody's to blame. And now here's the sad thing, too. You know, this guy kills two girls. And in the letter that the adoptive parents wrote, the criminal justice, that was one of the things he blamed also for the death of those two girls. It's the criminal justice system that killed him. You know, when these lawyers work together to uh, help the families write letters, especially the family of the accused, so these are more of the defense lawyers, they know that maybe there'll be a appeal process later on down the line. So they don't want letters of honesty. They want letters that, you know, may reflect some feelings from the parents, but also shift some level of accountability so they can utilize it later on. So, you know, so like if you got the parents outright saying, yeah, you know what, it's a shame. Uh, we knew something was wrong and, and, and we do believe uh, this, you know, he is this person and and they, they, they do something to hold them accountable. That messes up the, the defense lawyer. You know, the, the, the funny thing is, is it would be great if, you know, the prosecutor side can get the letter from the family uh, of the person who did it so they can get an honest letter as opposed to a letter that's filtered through a defense attorney who's going to now tell them exactly what to write so you don't go ahead and uh, pretty much speed up the the carrying out of the death sentence. So that letter shifts a lot of the accountability because they know that if you write something that showcases accountability to anybody, but, you know, I guess if, if you write something that showcases accountability directly to him, uh, then obviously w when it comes to challenging that, it makes it easier for them to say, hey, wait a second, hold on. What about the criminal justice system? What about his mental health? You know, what about, you know, what about all these excuses as to, you know, why he did what he did as opposed to saying, hey, he did it. Plain and simple. He cares about the excuses at this point. He killed two women. So I think this was a good dialogue. I hope you guys enjoy it. As always, guys, the show is tear If you haven't, please subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. Bell's good. Notify every time I post my video. Stay safe.